For centuries, mothers and fathers have read these stories to the delight of children everywhere. But there is one tale that has yet to be told. Ah! DreamWorks Pictures presents Shrek. Don't look down. Look down. Don't look down. Shrek, I'm looking down. The story of an unlikely hero oh. Oh. who rescues a beautiful princess. Oh. What? You didn't slay the dragon? It's on my to-do list. Mike Myers, Eddie Murphy, Cameron Diaz, John Lithgow. Oh. One of a kind. Then I saw her face. I'm a believer. Shrek. I just know before this is over, I'm gonna need a whole lot of serious therapy. Look at my eye twitching. Although the film might begin with a fairy tale storybook, beginning a retrospective review of Shrek, a 2001 3D animated DreamWorks feature, is not so linear. Do you start with Jeffrey Katzenberg, one of the founders of DreamWorks, alongside big-name director Steven Spielberg and producer David Geffen, who began his association with animation with the Walt Disney Corporation, alongside Michael Eisner, who we'll return to, and the late Frank Wells? Or do you start with the book? Before it was the franchise, Shrek, without an exclamation mark, was a children's book from 1990 by cartoonist William Steig. I can't recall it being published in Ireland, which is very strange to me because everyone here knows the films. The book is a world apart, not only in design, but style of writing and plot. I do not own a copy of the book, but from what I have seen of pages floating about online, my favourite part for the sheer morbidity of it has to be a scene at the end where Shrek gets married. No priest would officiate because God hated Shrek for being alive, so they used a crocodile. This book is Roald Dahl around for his money in terms of dark humour. But to begin with DreamWorks, Jeffrey Katzenberg left Disney on bad terms. With the tragic death of Frank Wells, Katzenberg sought to take his place, but Eisner disagreed. The first CGI animated film was Ants, which came out the same time as Pixar's The Bug's Life. The film sparked a feud between DreamWorks, Pixar and Steve Jobs, worth we're searching for the drama perhaps, but then again, both films feature actors who have been accused of sexual misconduct, so maybe best not. DreamWorks' next films will be traditionally animated, and there was also a brief partnership with Iron Man. It would be three years before they released another computer animated film, and this one would ensure their name would be remembered throughout the noughties. Shrek began his journey to the big screen as early as 1991 when Spielberg bought the rights to make an adaptation. The rights then passed to producer John H. Williams, and one year after DreamWorks was created, Jeffrey Katzenberg put it into development. Actors such as Bill Murray and Steve Martin were considered for Shrek and Donkey in the pre-DreamWorks era by Spielberg, and Nicolas Cage turned down the role because, and I quote, he didn't want to look like an ogre. Incidentally, the name Shrek is adapted from the Yiddish and German word, which means fear, fright, or terror. The actor Max Schreck famously played the vampire Nosferatu and was the namesake of Christopher Walken's character in Batman Returns. It was initially planned that comedy legend Chris Farley would play the role, but his untimely death in 1997 ensured a new voice actor for the titular character. Farley had recorded a sizable amount of lines for the film and a video of his work set to storyboards was leaked online, giving an interesting look at what might have been. Production on Shrek was anything but easy. The film began as a live-action CGI hybrid, but that would be abandoned after a test screening. Katzenberg stated, It looked terrible, it didn't work, it wasn't funny, and we didn't like it. Katzenberg also had creative differences with one of the directors of Shrek, Andrew Adamson, a New Zealander whose previous credits include VFX on the two Joe Schumacher Batman films. They disagreed over how much the film should appeal to adults. Katzenberg vetoed suggestions of Guns N' Roses in the soundtrack, as well as sexual jokes steaming them too outrageous. At the time, animators who had failed on other DreamWorks projects were sent to work on the film. It was known as getting shrekt, and described as being sent to the gulag, which gives you an idea of how low the opinion was of the production. I remember the general mood among the crew from the recollections of the people who worked on it to have been very, very low. It was detailed in a very good documentary shown on BBC3 called Shrek Once Upon a Time, narrated by David Tennant. It hasn't aired since 2013 and I have yet to see any footage from it show up online. For instance, if you type it into YouTube, you get results for the opening scene and not the documentary. A teaser trailer will be released in 2000, featured in this video. And you'll notice an early logo which looks awful. Thankfully, the final one would be much, much better. Shrek assembled an impressive cast of famous faces of the day. Comedian Mike Myers, known for Wayne's World and especially for the Austin Powers series, plays the ogre Shrek and it was only after recording his lines that he suggested re-recording them in a Scottish accent. 
a voice he's known to use in his comedies such as The Grotesque Fat Bastard and Austin Bowers 2. He tried out voicing Shrek with other accents like a Canadian one, but everyone agreed that his Scottish wouldn't fit the best. And from an outsider's perspective, it's difficult to imagine Myers Shrek as sounding any different. Eddie Murphy, another familiar face in the world of comedy, plays Donkey the Talking Animal. He previously played the dragon Mushu in Disney's Mulan and is known for his roles in Treading Places, Coming to America, the Beverly Hills Cop franchise, the Naughty Professor remake, and various other projects both acclaimed and reviled, comedic as well as dramatic. Cameron Diaz, who made her film debut in The Mask, plays as Princess Fiona. She gives a great performance and for me it's her best work as an actor. Diaz reprised her role in the sequels but has since retired from acting. The excellent John Lithgow plays the antagonist Lord Farquaad, whose name I am still surprised that the film got away with. You recognise Lithgow from films such as Santa Claus, Cliffhanger and Interstellar. It's been pointed out already but Farquaad is a thinly veiled pastiche of Michael Eisner with a small bit of Richard III, the Shakespeare version, not the historically accurate one. His short stature can be read as both a reference to a Napoleonic complex or more plausibly a reference to a comment by Eisner that Katzenberg was made aware of. It could also be payback on Katzenberg's part as he was apparently one of the inspirations in the design of the character of Hades, the villain of Disney's Hercules. Either way, Farquaad is essentially a two-fingered salute to Eisner, but Lithgow owns the role. And those are the actors that get top billing. Other names attached to Shrek include the late Kathleen Freeman as Donkey's owner. You might recognise her voice from the Naked Gun 33 and a third, the final insult. And she also made appearances in Jerry Lewis comedies in the 80s classic The Blues Brothers. She passed away on the 23rd of August 2001 at the age of 82. The most surprising inclusion to the film is respected French actor Vincent Cassel as Monsieur Hood. He's part of only two musical moments in the film, and it's one of the funniest scenes in it. There's a lot of clever innuendo in this sequence that you don't notice as a kid, and apparently they had to dial them back significantly. As is, in the film, he plays him like Errol Flynn crossed with Pepe Le Pew, or rather Errol Flynn with the Me Too aspects of his character turned up to 11. All the other parts are played by the crew working on it, like the great Conrad Vernon as the Gingerbread Man, Christopher Knights as Thelonious, and Chris Miller as the Magic Mirror. Voice acting veteran Jim Cummings, who's voiced among others for Disney Winnie the Pooh, plays the captain of the guards, and director Andrew Adamson has a cameo in the film as the man of the far quad mask. In retrospect, compared to how stun casting heavy a lot of animated projects get, the original Shrek is actually very restrained. It's worlds apart from Justin Timberlake in the third one, and certainly a hundred times better than the infamous Shark Tale. Was that cinema, Marty? Or did you just need the money? Shrek was released in cinemas on the 18th of May 2001 in the US, and in Ireland and the UK on the 29th of June that same year. It was hit all over the world and was even submitted to the Cannes Film Festival to be considered for the prestigious Palme d'Or. For real. Like, that's not a joke. And it was actually the first animated film to be screened at Cannes since Disney's Peter Pan in 1953. But unlike Peter Pan, Shrek does not have any offensive depictions of Native Americans. Critics and audiences adored the unconventional story, humour, and the heart of the film, and whether they were into critical theory or not, they appreciate the film's deconstruction of fairy tales and its no-holds-barred mocking of Disney. The original author, William Steig, saw the film with his children and grandchildren, and in contrast to the usual story of an author being unhappy, he did appreciate and applaud the creative team for their work. He enjoyed, in particular, the dragon chase. Steig was later quoted as saying, It's vulgar, it's disgusting, and I love it. He passed away in 2003 at the age of 95, and Shrek 2, released the next year, would be dedicated to his memory and his son went on to play the Pied Piper in Shrek Forever After. Shrek is also the film that made the song All-Star inseparable from the world of the ogre. Written for the ensemble superhero parody Mystery Men, it was everywhere for the next two years and was originally the temp track for the opening sequence. They honestly thought they'd find a better song to use later on. Eventually they realised the lightning in a ball decision they made, and the song remained in the film. Smash Mouth also recorded a cover of the Monkees classic I'm a Believer, which is covered again by Eddie Murphy at the end of the film. That one ties into the film a lot more with the opening line of I thought love was only true in fairy tales, but we know what song people think of when they think of Shrek. In 2020, the film was placed in the American Library of Congress as a significant film, the first animated film not made by Disney to be selected for preservation as an artefact of historical, aesthetic and cultural significance, and I can see why. It's an important film from the turn of the millennium, and looks of magic and whimsy with a cynical adult eye, which is why adults can relate to Shrek, perhaps even more so than children. And it did appeal to cynical ones who had copped onto the Disney magic and knew too true of the not so black and white real world. When your animated film opens with the main character wiping his arse with the pages of a storybook, an image that the original classic Disney stories utilised, I think it's fair to say you know what kind of film you're in for. I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. But with a film that deconstructs the tropes of fairy tales and Disney ones in particular, Shrek reaffirms the desire for a happy ending, that you should seek it out. Who cares if you're not conventionally attractive, rich as Croesus, or a blue-collar workman? In revisiting this film with a friend, a question arose on whether or not Shrek could be viewed through an LGBTQ plus lens. 
Shrek is the outsider, shunned by society much as members of the community have been ostracised. And the same could be said of Princess Fiona, who is human by day and an ogre by night. The villain rejects her like a homophobe rejects a gay friend, cousin, brother or sister, and a racist rejects a person of colour. Race and racism is another lens that Shrek could be seen through, and it would be interesting for more qualified academic persons than myself to make video essays or dissertations on. I'll discuss the sequel as I come to the end of this video, but it's true that the inspiration for it was written with the Sydney Poitier classic Guess Who's Coming to Dinner as inspiration for Shrek's meeting with Fiona's parents, Queen Lillian and King Harold. The soundtrack to Shrek is deeply underrated. I don't mean the songs, they're already beloved, but I mean the work by Harry Gregson Williams and John Powell. You only have to hear the opening notes, the fairy tale theme, to be whisked back to Halcyon Days of videotapes, DVDs, and Saturday Night Big Big Movies, a little growing up in Ireland reference for you there. A standout scene of the film made more potent thanks to the score has to be Shrek's dinner. Eating alone, as it's called in the tracks list, captures the loneliness of the ogre. You might think, and indeed he does, that he's content at just being an ogre scaring angry villagers, but the music tells us something different. The reef glanced to beyond the door, and we see the wheels turning in his head. Do I let Donkey in? Do I allow myself to connect with an outcast not too dissimilar to myself? But his decision is ultimately a no. Sideways is an excellent video on the Shrek soundtrack and how it uses pop and orchestral music. The jukebox of Joan Jen Smash Mouth one of the best uses of the toe-tapping proclaimer song on my way is the false face, and Powell and Gregson Williams' work is the true one. The film also features a cover of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, a song if you actually pay attention to the lyrics sounds like the last thing you'd want to put in a family film. The CD has Rufus Wainwright's version, but the film has one by John Cale. Music labels are a tricky business, from what I recall it was a compromise. Shrek might have songs like this, but what you find while watching the film is that it shuts down the idea of breaking into song and dance and being a musical. Think of the hilarious Monsieur Hood number that ends abruptly with Fiona kicking him in the face, or the thinly veiled It's a Small World After All parody Welcome to Duloc. Shrek also shuts down Donkey's attempts to break into song, in particular singing a Bette Midler number when they meet. For some reason, the Blu-ray makes a change to the DVD where, instead of Murphy singing a cappella, they add an instrumental which goes all wonky when Shrek shouts a donkey to stop singing. It's not quite a George Lucas Star Wars change, but it's noticeable if you, like me, grew up with the film on DVD. I can't vouch for the VHS as I haven't watched it in so many years, and I don't think I have a telly that's compatible with it anymore. There's also an echo added to the moment where Shrek shouts, What are you doing in my swamp? to the fairy tale creatures. At least it sounded like one when I watched this in May. The sequel has a couple of changes too, depending on what part of the world you live in. Two years after its debut, Shrek received a theme park ride as part of Universal Studios titled Shrek 4D. It took place immediately after the first film and featured the ghost of Lord Farquaad taking revenge on Shrek and Donkey while attempting to take Fiona's life so she could become Queen of the Underworld alongside him. It might read as wafer thin, because it kind of is. When it comes to theme park rides, more effort is put into the technical experience, at least it usually is. All the cast from the first film reprised their roles for the short because it was in their contract, and it utilises one of the potential plots for a second film that author William Steig vetoed, and for good reason. John Lithgow's Farquaad is a great present in the first film, but bringing him back as a ghost undermines a cathartic comeuppance of the jaws of dragon. The ride was active in Universal Studios Hollywood from 2003 until 2017, and at the time of recording this, it is still available at the one in Florida. For some reason, probably money. The film got a home video release under the even more gimmicky title Shrek 3D, with red and blue paper glasses included. You can also find it on Netflix as part of a collection of animated shorts. It's listed there as Shrek, the ghost of Lord Farquaad, and without the added tricks of a theme park ride, makes for awkward viewing. In 2004, everyone's favourite ogre and his friends returned with a sequel, Shrek 2. It was embraced by the critics and audience members, became a box office success, and I'm choosing my words very carefully with what I say here, because if all goes well, I might make a video on this one when the time is right. Some cite it as the only good comedy sequel, and perhaps among the many acclaimed sequels that are as good as, if not better, than their predecessors. The film switches the action from Duloc and a swamp to the Beverly Hills-inspired kingdom of Far, Far Away. It makes for a great satire on celebrity culture. Shafrilis Productions, in addition to other excellent, non-ironic video essays on the Shrek series of films, made a great video on why it's a perfect sequel. For definite, the passion of the original is here as well, and it gives us a new fan favourite like Antonio Banderas's Puss in Boots, and has the two most recognisable Brits in modern cinema history, Julie Andrews and John Cleese as Fiona's parents, as well as comedian Jennifer Saunders as the tyrannical fairy godmother. Comedies are so rare to make well twice, and Shrek 2 not only does it again, but does it far better than anyone could have ever hoped for, and feels like an unambiguous triumphant ending. More's the pity that DreamWorks creative team swimming in the money that the sequel made, 
decided to greenlight Shrek the Third and release it to a 2007 audience. This one's generally seen as a disappointment at best and a terrible sequel to worse. Like trying to keep the same energy going at a party after most of the guests have gone home and everyone else is tired because it's 2 or 3 in the morning. While Rupert Everett was a great foil in the previous film's Prince Charming, the reason he worked in Shrek 2 was that he was a supporting villain. Paired alongside the fairy godmother, he's great, but having him lead the film as his main threat feels incongruous. No disrespect to Everett, but his character just isn't as interesting on his own compared to Lithgow's Farquhar or Saunders' godmother. It doesn't help that the film is nowhere near as funny as the first or second. Alongside the oversaturation of the brand, thanks to short films and spin-offs that made us all feel tired of the property, I feel like this is also the film where the memory of the internet started taking off, leading to a lot of bad taste, questionable fan fiction like a famous one I will not be discussing further. You know exactly the one I'm talking about. There's no point in me saying what's already been said. Yeah, so Shrek the Third, it's not great. But Shrek would return one more time in 2010. The last film, which switched to a more cinematic aspect ratio, was Shrek Forever After. Like the third, this one didn't get the praise one and two got, and continued to get, and made people instead yearn for the halcyon days where Shrek was critically acclaimed with a tired It's a Wonderful Lifestyle parallel universe where... Shrek's never born. However, critics agreed it was better than its predecessor and some fans felt it was a much better note to end the series on at the time. For me, this film came out as I was about to start my last year in primary school, so I associate with a personal ending as much as a final chapter as it was marketed. The tie-in song by Lucy Schwartz and Landon Pig is lovely too. It's up there with one of the best songs used in the films, for my money at least. A spin-off Puss in Boots came out the next year. I don't remember much about it. It's like Alphanakis was in it. Talks of reviving Shrek for a fifth film have been floating around for years. It might be made or it might be shelved, who knows. But if Shrek does return, it'll be more than likely a soft reboot. Mike Myers might well return as the titular character, but I wonder if they'll have to engage in heavy talks to convince Cameron Diaz. The question of whether or not Shrek can still be relevant to a 2020s audience as it was to millennials or Generation Z does pop up in my mind when I think of them doing more films. I don't think there's a definitive answer, you'll only know when you actually go and do it. If they wanted to make it more like the book by Steig, then I'd be fine with that. It'd be different at least. Some might call that sacrilege, but I say if it makes sense, then they should. My own experience with Shrek is a happy one. I remember this VHS now dog-eared and possibly worn out and not checked. And the DVD, and growing up in a house with greyhounds, I know that one of them was named Princess Fiona. I've already mentioned the possibility of Shrek being an LGBTQ plus film, but it could well be a good film to read through an autistic lens. And watching the film for its 20th anniversary in May 2021 alongside a good friend, seeing Eddie Murphy's donkey talk at length about subjects that don't interest Shrek, led to a comment about the character being on the spectrum. I can't speak for everyone's experience of being autistic, but I could definitely sigh with that introspective embarrassment and wittering on about cartoons and television shows and movies to my family. And it's just a really good comedy. One of the things you find yourself worrying about when your stories are adapted by a big studio is whether or not they'll lose the magic of the heart or if they'll tone down a lot of what separate the source material from its contemporaries. Think of how the film of a series of unfortunate events resolves with a comeuppance for Jim Carrey's Count Olaf, whereas the books leave a lot of things vague and open to interpretation, and the moments of hope for the Baudelaire children are few and far between. Incidentally, if you want a much better adaptation, I'd recommend watching the Netflix series produced by Barry Sonnenfeld. Indeed, that's what Steig and his family initially thought before they got to see the film. Shrek might well be a big-budget movie from a major studio, but has a quirkiness that you'd find more at home in independent cinema. I personally think the animation has aged quite well for a film released 20 years ago. So much has changed since the film was made. You can have much more convincing 3D characters on film, but the offers of this scene are worth lots of praise in my opinion. However, if you're someone who feels that the opening credits are showing their age, I can understand where you're coming from. If there's anything that the original Shrek falters in, for me personally, it's the dip in pacing between Shrek leaving Fiona to get married to Farquaad and then being convinced to go after her by Donkey. I know why it's there, don't get me wrong. It's just one of those moments that you don't really pay attention to when you're a kid. I'm not really here for any kind of nitpicks like an ogre being able to wrestle loads of guards in one scene until a whole pile of them are splitting Fiona and Shrek up at the end because that's not what's important. And I know some people would complain about how Shrek hears Fiona's lines out of context as an irritating cliché present in too many films to count, but when the rest of the film is as good as it is, you're not really bothered by things like that, I find. I don't think so anyway, it's far from the worst example of a trope like that. I mean, Shrek 2 has the same moment, but it's much more refined and makes more sense dramatically to have him be convinced to leave Fiona than do a true what the TV Tropes website defines as the third act misunderstanding. One thing that DreamWorks movies popularised is the end of movie sing-along. They weren't the first to do it, if I recall correctly. And it's not bad here, but it's sadly the beginning of another 
cliche that lazier, mediocre animated films slap on as a last minute bit of noise to entertain the kids. And if there's one thing you can describe Shrek as, it's not a bit of noise. For all the parodies, the iconic moments and the memes, the original ogre holds up after 20 years. Shrek is a ton of fun with that little extra humour that the grown-ups and critics get. I don't think rose-tinted glasses apply here. You can certainly look wistfully to your videotape and dream of the more innocent times now far, far away and... Oh God, is that comic sense? Why didn't they put the logo on the paper instead of that ch But with or without the nostalgia, it's an important film. It's aged much better than other gross-out comedies from that time, and it's much smarter than a lot of them too. Marketed as the greatest fairy tale never told, I hope that we continue to tell it for many years to come. I can't breathe.